Ronnie Green. I have the privilege of serving as the INR Vice Chancellor here at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and as Vice President of the University for Agriculture and Natural Resources. Welcome to our Hearman Lecture this evening. The Hearman Lectures is an effort of the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources that we started now going on four years ago as a new lecture series focused on global issues around food, water, natural resource, energy, and rural security, and all issues that might fall into that bucket that we work on in our areas here at the university. We've been very pleased to be able to start this lecture series due to the generous support of the Hearman family for which the lecture series is named. And I, I regret to tell you this is the first lecture in the history of the Hearman Lectures that Keith and Norma are not able to join us tonight. Uh, they send their regrets to you. The Hearmans are longtime production agriculture people from central, south central Nebraska, uh, the Phillips area just west of us here in Lincoln. So please join me in thanking the Hearman family for enabling us to have this lecture. Now, we, we are here in the East Union tonight on campus, but we have folks joining us through the live streaming of the lectures um, out across the campus and in the, across the state, in fact, for us in INR. And these are also uh, seen later on Nebraska Educational Television. So the lectures, uh, as you will be able to go to the web and see previous lectures from the last several years, you will see the opportunity for those to gain quite a wide audience, so we're pleased again tonight for that to be the case. We have a number of dignitaries with us tonight. I won't introduce them individually, but just to say to you, we're very pleased that several of our state senators from the Nebraska legislature are with us here tonight. Our Director of Agriculture here in the state uh, is also with us tonight, and we appreciate you very much for being here and being part of our dialogue. Now, we, we uh, thought that a very relevant topic to bring to the lectures this year is the topic that we have tonight, where you're going to be able to hear from a very distinguished panel some dialogue about the issue of where does the U.S. currently fall in leading the world in innovation around agriculture and food and the natural resources arenas where we have traditionally been the world leader in these fields and have been since the advent, uh, really, of the land-grant system now 150 years ago. We, we have asked this panel to first give you some insight, and a couple of our panelists will do that initially in the discussion, and then we'll have a dialogue amongst the three of us uh, to explore some of the issues around this topic uh, and let you listen in on that conversation, if you will, and that dialogue around some particular points of the subject. And then we're planning to open the floor to you. So in the last part of the lecture, in our time this evening, we'll have mics on the floor. So please be thinking about questions that come to your mind during the dialogue and during the discussion that you'd like to pose to the panel and have them address on this subject. Let me first introduce our three panelists uh, that are with us tonight. First, uh, to my immediate left, Dr. Kathy Wotecki. Kathy is the USDA Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, what's often called the REE mission area of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and serving in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as Deputy Associate Director for Science, uh, where she co-authored um, the Clinton administration's policy statement, Science in the National Interest. Uh, she was the first food secretary, food, food safety undersecretary at the time when she authored that publication in USDA. From 2002 to 2005, 
Kathy was the Dean of Agriculture and Professor of Human Nutrition at Iowa State University, just to our east here in our border state, where she also headed the Agricultural Experiment Station for the state of Iowa. She has served as the Global Director of Scientific Affairs for Mars Incorporated and as Director of the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences. She has also co-authored a nutrition book entitled Eat for Life that has become a Book of the Month club selection in its history. In 1999, she was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, her research interests include nutrition, food safety policy, risk assessment, and health survey design and analysis. Kathy is the author of over 60 refereed scientific articles, 12 books, and technical reports. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathy Wotekwe. Now, our next uh, panelist uh, kidded with me a few weeks ago that people in Kansas were going to begin wondering why he's been in Nebraska twice in the last year and a half. But uh, Dan Glickman, who served as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture from 1995 to 2001 in the Clinton administration, and he is currently the Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Congressional Program. Uh, Dan, for 18 years, represented Kansas' 4th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he was very involved in federal farm policy and in the House Agriculture Committee. He also served on the House Judiciary Committee as a chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. After his term as USDA Secretary, he served as chairman of the Motion Pictures Association of America, Incorporated. He has been director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard's, Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He, along with World Food Prize recipient, and you will remember Catherine Bertini, who was an earlier uh, Hearman lecturer, so along with Kathy, uh, Dan was the co-chair, and he's ser currently serving as the co-chair of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Global Agricultural Development Initiative. He's a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center and a co-chair of AGREE, a long-term nonpartisan initiative funded by some of the largest foundations in the world to look at the consequences of food and agriculture policy. Please join me in welcoming former Secretary Dan Glickman. <laughs> and thirdly on our panel tonight, we're very pleased to have Dr. Phil Pardee, Phil is a professor in the Department of Applied Economics at the University of Minnesota, where he also directs the university's International Science and Technology Practice and Policy Center. Prior to joining the University of Minnesota in 2002, he was a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, and previously a senior research officer at the International Service for National Agricultural Research in The Hague in the Netherlands. His research deals with the finance and conduct, conduct of research and development globally and its economic consequences, the bioeconomics of agricultural production and productivity worldwide, and the economic and policy, especially intellectual property aspects of genetic resources and the biosciences. He is a fellow of the American Agricultural Economics Association, a distinguished fellow and past president of the Australian Agricultural and Resource Economic Society, and has been awarded the SEAL Prize for Excellence in Agriculture. His books include Ending Hunger in Our Lifetime, Food Security and Globalization, and Persistence Pays, U.S. Agricultural Productivity, Growth, and the Benefits from Public Research and Development Spending. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pete Pardee to our panel this evening. Now you may have seen in, in our previous advertising for tonight's lecture that we had had the intention, as had Clayton Yider, had the intention of joining us tonight as a co-moderator of the panel. And I regret to inform you that due to health, uh, uh, health circumstances with Clayton, a former Secretary of Agriculture, as you know, here from Nebraska, uh, that he was unable to travel and be here with us. Uh, Clayton is fighting liver cancer currently, so please keep him and his family 
uh, in your thoughts and prayers as he confronts that disease. He sends his, his regards to you. He told me up until last week he was going to be here one way or the other, so he really regrets having to miss uh, the event tonight, but keep him in your thoughts. So with that introduction, I'm going to ask Dr. Wotecki to come to the podium, and she's going to kick us off tonight with the federal perspective on this topic. Please join me in welcoming Kathy Wotecki. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Green, and uh, also thank you, audience, for the warm welcome to campus. It's a delight to be back at the University of Nebraska and also to be part of this um, very prestigious lecture series. So I've been asked uh, to kind of set the scene for uh, this evening's discussion. And what I'd like to do is to cover off on, on three points, uh, to talk about some of the challenges that are facing agriculture uh, now and into the rest of this century, uh, to talk a little bit about the current structure of the research enterprise uh, for agriculture and food here in the United States and, and kind of set it in a global context. And then thirdly, um, to give you kind of a, a snapshot of the current status of uh, U.S. agricultural research funding and how it stacks up against uh, other countries. So when we think about agriculture, um, we, we have to recognize that agriculture here in the U.S. is really a very dynamic, complex, social and ecological system, and that's what I'm trying to show in this very busy slide. Um, crop and food animal production are dependent on the complex flow of resources regulated by internal processes and interactions between ecological and, and social elements of the system that exist and, and function at multiple scales of space and time and, and social organization. So this, this social and ecological system consists of ecological components and processes that are shown on the left, and the human components, um, the, 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 the structure of agriculture, the markets, the governments, the regulations that we put in place, and, and those are shown on the right. And in the center of this is the integration that represents the overlap in, in these ecological and, and social systems. And the U.S. agricultural system also interacts globally, you know, with the global climate, with large-scale bio and geochemical conditions, and also is affected and interacts with the global political and economic conditions. Agriculture plays a really important role in the American economy, and there are a whole lot of different ways that we could describe that food and agricultural system. Uh, we could talk about it as a sector of our economy. We could talk about it as farm income and farm households. We could talk about it from the perspective of agriculture in the rural economy and agricultural production and prices or trade or food availability and consumption or food prices and spending, or we could look at it through the lens of food security and what that means for people at different income levels in the U.S. And the e Economic Research Service uh, at USDA, one of the agencies in the portfolio that I have oversight for, has recently put online a product that's called Ag and Food Statistics, charting the Essentials, which in 75 different charts tries to describe um, and give you a, an overview of the agricultural system in the United States today based on all of the, the current data that they have. But I've excerpted from that just a couple of slides for, for this evening. And this one, I think, is also a, a, an enormously important one and one that the public generally does not understand and that is that nearly one in 10 jobs in the United States um, is linked to agriculture and, and the food-related industries. And that uh, totals up to about 16 million jobs currently in the economy. 
Um, also, agriculture has, has played over the last few decades a very important role in trade and in the balance of payments that we have. Um, our commodity exports uh, are, have, have kind of uh, changed over, over that period in time and, and been influenced by that global market as well as conditions here at home. Our major uh, agricultural exports are shown here and, and a good example of one that has been very much affected by uh, conditions here at home is the share of our exports that corn represents. They've fallen significantly since 1989, but that's largely because of the increased domestic use for ethanol production, which has been a very important part of building the bioeconomy here in the U.S. And, and lastly, from this uh, slide deck that uh, uh, ERS has, has put together uh, and that is available online, as you know, if we look at this food system from the perspective of where the portion of the food dollar goes, Americans' demand for processed food products shows up as the processing share of this food dollar. The farm share currently is about 10.8% uh, of that overall food dollar, and the processing sector representing about 22% of that food dollar. In the science community, uh, there's uh, a recognition uh, that agriculture faces some very substantial challenges in the decades ahead. And this has led us in the science community to articulate a set of what we see as grand challenges to agriculture. These include food security, both here at home as well as internationally, and uh, food safety. It's not enough to produce enough food, but that also, when it comes to the consumer's table, needs to be safe. Um, human nutrition, uh, particularly the right assortment of foods that's going to promote lifelong good health. Uh, production of uh, renewable energy in the form of bioenergy as well as high value chemicals that are going to be uh, value added to uh, the production of, of energy from, from bio sources, biological sources. And doing all of this in the context of a changing climate and in ways that are going to be long-term sustainable. We have been orienting our research programs at the department uh, to face these grand challenges, to address them uh, through a combination of our in-house laboratories as well as the support of scientists uh, that are at land-grant university campuses and other research organizations across the country. Since the 1980s, um, U.S. agriculture has been enormously successful in increasing output, while inputs have remained about the same. Uh, the inputs are the, the red line that's fairly steady across the bottom of this slide. The outputs are in green. And the blue uh, line that's kind of paralleling that uh, increase in outputs uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, to what economists call total factor productivity. So this increase in productivity that we've seen in U.S. agriculture is largely attributed to what the economists call total factor productivity, which is the uh, uh, science-based innovation and know-how uh, that our farmers have in how to apply this science-based innovation. Uh, there's also a very close correlation between our research investment and the, these increases in productivity as measured in total factor productivity. Research um, is supported uh, by not only the federal government, but also the states uh, and the private sector. And here we've shown on the left-hand side um, the U.S. investment in food and agricultural research. Uh, uh, the data come from about five years ago, 2008. 
And at that point in time, the public sector was contributing about $5.2 billion combined funding from federal and state funds to support agricultural research. And the private sector uh, was surpassing that with an overall investment of about $6.7 billion, of which 3.8 was really focused towards production agriculture and the remaining $2.9 billion to food processing and product development research. Um, the global research investment is the larger circle to the right. And uh, in 2008, that totaled about $54 billion, $54.2 billion. And uh, this public investment um, in the global sphere is actually larger than the private sector investment. So it's a little bit different picture of that investment. But I think another important takeaway from this is the US investment is about 20% of the global investment in agricultural research. So here at home, the, the public elements of our research infrastructure consist of the federal investment, uh, most of that coming from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and that federal investment is about 50-50 in an in intramural or in-house laboratory system, the Agricultural Research Service and the Economic Research Service. Uh, and about 50% of it goes to universities. Um, those are mostly our land-grant university partners like the University of Nebraska. Um, and that investment is also subdivided. About $265 million a year goes to support competitive uh, uh, grants, uh, and the remainder flows to the universities to fund the state agricultural experiment stations and also cooperative extension. The state uh, plays a very important role, though. And that's often <coughs> overlooked. Um, the federal funds that flow through the capacity systems to fund the experiment stations and cooperative extension are required to, to have states match those funds. And in most states, their match actually surpasses what they are required to do. And uh, it, I think, is a very important um, uh, statement uh, on the part of, of state legislatures that view this investment as being really important in supporting agriculture within their states. Private elements of this research enterprise in the U.S. are the agricultural inputs sector, um, chemicals, seed companies, farm manufacturing, farm equipment, um, as well as the food processing sector. And unlike some other disciplinary areas, for example, in, in health or medical research, where there are a number of large foundations that make very substantial investments, up until very recently, that has not been the case for agriculture. Um, so the, the implications of this for our um, overall food and agricultural economy are that um, this agricultural R&D supports our domestic agricultural production um, with funding that's coming from the states, from the federal partners, and from the private industry. And that, in turn, for agriculture, um, generates out of that production about 120 billion or, or more in, towards our gross domestic product, about 2 million jobs in the production agriculture uh, sphere, and about $20 billion of net exports. The additional funding that comes largely from the private sector to support R&D uh, in the food industry most of that is in product development, a certain amount in food safety. That also, in turn, generates um, an additional $165 billion towards our gross domestic product and an additional 1.6 million jobs. So it's a very important input um, to this important sector of our economy. 
Now, since 1980, this total factor of productivity, that science-based innovation and the know-how on how to apply it, that total factor productivity growth has actually been on the decline. Federal budget cuts in 2011, 2012, and 2013 have caused concern about what that implies for the future of American agriculture and its competitiveness in international markets. The Economic Research Service has projected three different uh, levels of appropriations to mid-century, uh, three different scenarios, uh, and uh, they're shown on, on this slide. What the effects of these different investment levels would be in the growth in total factor productivity from now to the year 2050. So the bottom line that's shown there is that if the congressional appropriations stay the same, meaning you know, no inflationary adjustments, um, that our total factor productivity would continue to drop. Um, if the appropriations keep up with inflation, uh, total factor productivity would stay about the same, and that's that green line that's kind of there in the, in the center. And uh, if appropriations increase by a relatively modest 1% per year, total factor productivity would be projected to increase to mid-century. And if you show this uh, in a slightly different way, showing this historical trend in, in total factor productivity over time and the three projections out to mid-century, you can see that um, the projection, um, if things stay the same with no inflationary increases, that um, the total factor productivity growth would fall to under 0.75%. Um, and this is compared to our historical increase of about 1.5% per year. And that would mean that our total output by the year 2050 would only increase by about 40%, which would have a really serious implications for what we would be able to provide as far as trade. We'd be able to meet our requirements under this projection, but it would call into question what we would be able to do for trade. And at this point, with our last few years' worth of, of decreases, we have actually fallen off this bottom, bottom line. Um, if you look uh, as well at uh, how our public investment stacks up against other countries, the U.S. is the, the line that uh, in the early years here, back around 1980 on this slide, uh, the U.S. was the dominant funder of agricultural research. And the three lines that are, that are grouped down at the bottom, uh, China in the light blue, India in the red, and Brazil in the green, were kind of all grouped together. Uh, but since uh, the year um, about 2000, China has uh, dramatically changed its policies about agricultural research is making substantial investments and has now surpassed the United States as being the uh, one country in the world with the largest investment in agricultural science. Uh, India is continuing to increase its investment and uh, we are, again, just coming out of um, a, a period of stagnation followed by three years of very substantial decreases. Now, I have to say that what I've heard today about the uh, appropriations for the remainder of 2014, it looks like agricultural research that that decline is stopped. So that's good news. Um, as far as what does this mean for the future, um, we can look at analyses of the growth in total factor productivity in other countries and, and compare them. And, and you can see here from the slide that those countries that are making a substantial increase uh, in their funding of research and coupling that with education are seeing some dramatic increases in their total factor productivity. 
Uh, Brazil is at the top here in green, followed by China in the most recent years. And we're um, lagging a bit in recent years, but still uh, ahead of India with respect to um, increases in total factor productivity. So to wrap up, um, the current status of agricultural research in the US is one of, I think, increasing concern among thought leaders about trends in agricultural productivity growth related to our stagnation and decrease in investment, and concerns as well about what that means overall for agricultural productivity in the US. Um, the fact that organizations like the one that, that uh, former Secretary Glickman is leading in the Chicago Council and also this very big uh, uh, foundation funded uh, <coughs> review of agricultural policy and the attention that they're paying to agricultural research, I think is also an indication that thought leaders are concerned about this. Um, Secondly, um, I think there's also recognition that the magnitude of these future challenges to agriculture, these grand challenges are ones that are facing us here in the United States, and they're also facing us globally. And that they also, because they are so important, uh, that they are also being recognized as important to our national security, that we have to address these emerging grand challenges, and that agriculture actually has a role to play in the solutions. And then lastly, I, I do believe that there is a, an increase in public awareness of agriculture, uh, a public concern, and uh, from you know, The Economist to major uh, daily newspapers to uh, television shows. Um, increasingly, there are agriculture-related articles uh, that are highlighting um, the very critical role that agriculture plays in the U.S. and are generating uh, a sense of concern and certainly raising the public consciousness about this. Uh, all of this, though, is also playing out against a background of increasing concern about the values in agriculture and how we are uh, going to be able to address these grand challenges and also to bring along the public uh, in creating solutions that are going to be socially acceptable is going to be another grand challenge. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to kind of set the context for this evening. And I'm really looking forward to the, the questions and, and the debate. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. Now I'm going to call on uh, Dan Glickman. And Dan is going to come and provide some perspective on what Kathy referred to earlier about some of these thought leader groups that have been discussing these issues. Please join me in welcoming Dan Glickman to the podium. Thank you, Ronnie. <clears throat> thank you, Ronnie, very much. Uh, and to Kathy Wojcicki, who's an outstanding public servant. She was head of food safety. We made remarkable progress in food safety, and while well, she was uh, the undersecretary and now in research, she's got this amazing talent. You know, I'm, I've told this joke before, but I, I couldn't help but listening to, I, and I know Ronnie's pedigree is as good as any of ours. And then you've got Kathy and Phil, and the old joke about the two dairy cows that were grazing along the side of the road, and all of a sudden a milk truck drives by, and the side of the milk truck is written in big red letters, pasteurized, homogenized vitamin enriched, good for you. And one dairy cow looks at the other dairy cow and says, kind of makes you feel inadequate, doesn't it? <laughs> so these people are amazing. I'm kind of the politician in the crowd, so uh, I'll try not to disappoint. First of all, I want to say a word about Clayton Yider, a great friend of mine, great mentor. We will all wish him well. You also have a co former colleague, uh, Mike Johans, secretary, still senator, 
Wish he could stay senator, and I say that as a Democrat, so don't tell him that because it could be a <laughs> problem for him. But uh, he's, a, he's a good friend and a, and a great leader. And then I don't know everybody in the congressional delegation well, but I do know your local congressman, Jeff Fortin, very, very well. And, he, and we've worked together on a, on a lot of different issues. If you notice, I wore a red tie today. I, I have a little a conflict here because I went to school in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so there's something called maize and blue. And then I came from Kansas, and I think there were people worried that I was going to have a purple tie. We were I, worried. I wouldn't wear a purple tie, trust me. <laughs> but anyway, so um, anyway, I'd, I'm delighted uh, to be here uh, back on this great campus, a great agriculture institution, world famous, and uh, talking a little bit about how you all can be leaders in this effort to upgrade our agricultural research. I must say is one more thing. I was picked up at the airport today by Kathy Wotecki. She uh, and her uh, colleague Karen Wilcox drove me here and I was kept thinking along the way I wonder if they read that uh, news story about Southwest Airlines plane that landed in the wrong airport <laughs> <laughs> but but we got they got me here so anyway I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I thanks for uh, Ronnie and the folks for inviting me again let me just make a couple of comments one is and it's going to build on what Kathy said we face an immense challenge in this world. How are we going to feed a planet with two billion more people in the coming decades? With demographic shifts, in rising incomes in the developing world, growing needs for energy because agriculture is the most energy intensive industry in the world, and, and increasing demands for better food, higher quality food. How are we going to do all that with a land base that isn't going to increase? Uh, because we're not going to rip up the forests of this world and rip up the Amazon and everything else. We're going to have to produce additional food. In addition, there are about 900 million people that are already chronically hungry and 2.5 million children die every year from malnutrition in the world. We're lucky in America. Other places aren't so lucky. And while progress has been made, finding sustainable solutions to these problems are not as easy as they once were. Food production is projected to become more unstable. Whether you believe in, quote, climate change or not, rising temperatures and changes in rainfall patterns are predicted in the world, whatever their cause, upending the places where crops can be grown while creating more virulent pests and diseases. The global food system is growing more fragile. Ag productivity globally could decline 2% each decade because of just these weather volatility changes that I've talked about. In recent years, we have seen natural disasters um, uh, spark fears of grain shortages, cause panic in markets, and destabilize governments in North Africa. And the Arab Spring was in large part caused by shortages and price spikes of food. Volatility is expected to increase as larger populations face growing food scarcity in the world. So despite all these challenges, if I had one point to lead you today, and that is, is that the agriculture research in the U.S. has been underfunded, fallen behind other countries, as Kathy talked about, but the U.S. is uniquely positioned to lead a global call for action. In the same way we did it when Norman Borlaug led the Green Revolution back 30, 40, 50 years ago, we are in a position to do the same thing, to help ourselves and help the rest of the world in, in, in this process. Now, Kathy talked about the patterns of, of budgeting, and I'm not going to go into a great deal except to say that in both real and absolute dollars, total funding for USDA's ag research is falling. And that's at a time we near, need to nearly double food production by 2050 to meet global demand. The only area of the USDA's research budget which has been consistently in receiving an increase, and let's perhaps this year we may be getting in other places, has been from uh, the Agriculture and Food Research Institute, which is all competitively awarded, peer-reviewed research. And as you saw, our competitors in the world are taking a different tack than we are. Not, now, not every research arm of the government has been hurt as badly as we are. You look at the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Pentagon. Pentagon has the largest research budget in the world, in the world. And, you know, we continue to fund those things because the public supports those things. So what we have to do is to look at what we can do to get ourselves to get more public support for this research and to reverse these trends that we have been talking about. Now I want to talk about 
what, why this is all happening and what we need to do to correct it. I hope that I, this, my remarks are positive in the sense that we can capture this issue and, and deal with it in a positive way. And I'm also reminded there was a philosopher named John Maynard Keynes who said, for every complicated problem, <laughs> there is a simple and a wrong solution. So these are very complicated problems, all of them, but they're all capable of us getting resolved. And the first thing we have to do is we have to analyze what we're spending our money on to make sure that it's effective. While I believe that we need to radically increase the total amount of money we spend on agriculture research, we also have to make sure that we're measuring it and it has a payoff to it. It just doesn't mean more money means better. It means more money plus better management, uh, plus payoff, plus metrics. Uh, we have to analyze to make sure that the money is being well spent. I think under Kathy's leadership, that is the case. The second thing is, is it has to do with human capacity. So here you have this great university that's turning out students that are going to lead the world in the area of food and agriculture production. But we have to ask the question, how do we train adequate people in food and ag sciences at home and abroad? In years past, we always had a good national uh, uh, education effort uh, on agriculture research at home through the land grant system and everything else, and it's kind of fallen down. But it's coming back now as agriculture is seen as a much more economically viable operation. So we have to ask, how do we make food and agriculture relevant to young people in this country? And we need to coordinate with other disciplines like the environment, energy, health, communications, other sciences, the high-tech world, to make sure that people going to school know that this is a vital, dramatic area, economically rewardable, and something that's important for them. Human capacity is the key that's made American agriculture great and the American research institutions great, and that has to be a focus of what we're talking about. The second thing has to do with public relations. And here I'm putting on my political ad. The image of food and agriculture is getting better, as Kathy talked about. Uh, and we're now seeing food issues being talked about in other sectors. It's raised its level worldwide in terms of, of political issues. And I think that's all very important. But if you look at this farm bill that Congress is debating now and still hasn't worked out after three years, you really don't hear anything about the subjects that we talked about at all. We hear about what the dairy program should look like. We hear about what the level of the food stamps should be, all important issues. We hear about what kind of payment limits there should be on amount of farm program payments. But we hear very, very little about the future of agriculture, about the ability to feed the world in a sustainable way about how to produce a strong, economically viable rural America and rural world in the future. And so that creates a negative perception of agriculture in, among the general public. Um, it's tough enough when you're out here watching all these stories, but when you see front page story after front page story in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and, and, and on CNN and everywhere else, why can't Congress get its act together on a farm bill? It doesn't create a very good feeling in the minds of a lot of folks that agriculture has its act together. And it relates directly to the issue of ag research that we're talking about now because it has to do with inspiring people to realize that this is a very, very important part of, of the issue. There are a lot of other issues that I would talk about in this, in this area, but I want to talk about the kinds of things, from my judgment, working with AGREE and the Chicago Council that we need to work on at home and abroad to kind of set the priorities for what the real challenges are in the future. I call it the asteroid theory of life. What are the asteroids coming in that could really impact producers of food and fiber, of plants and animal agriculture that could make it very, very serious or very, very challenging in the world for us to be continued leaders? And what are some of those things? Well, I mentioned one of the things was volatile weather, droughts, uh, extreme weather events, uh, extreme precipitation events, flooding, how we're going to produce crops during that time period. Second has to do with the yield gap. I think this was in one of uh, Kathy's slides. Our ability to increase yields in the basic commodities, particularly in maize, corn, wheat, and rice, 
will have a lot to do whether the rest of the world is going to be able to be fed in the future. And that yield gap is not what it used to be, in part because we're not spending the resources that we need to spend on it. That's a real problem. The third thing has to do with diseases and droughts, both plant diseases, animal diseases, and human diseases, and they're all linked together. Uh, Norman Borlaug realized this a long time ago when he saw the issue of wheat rust being something that could wipe out the ability to grow wheat and other grasses around the world. These are real problems, and, and agriculture research has to be at the forefront of these things, whether you're talking about plant diseases or animal diseases, and they're all linked with human diseases as well. A fourth area is in the area of diet, nutrition, and health. The fact of the matter is, is that medical science is getting better and better all the time, and it's providing a lot of answers, a lot of good information, and some bad information about what people ought to be eating. But the truth of the matter is the consumer is becoming more and more engaged in what he or she eats. And in doing so, agriculture is going to have to deal with the challenges of the vagaries of consumers who may change their mind overnight or may get bad information overnight. This is a, 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 both a problem and an opportunity for agriculture, and our research establishment has to, be, uh, has to deal with that. The fifth is energy. So we talked about the fact that we don't export as much corn because 40% of the corn is grown for ethanol, and that's a good thing. But agriculture is also the most energy-intensive part of our nation's economy and the world economy. And coming up with ways that use less energy to produce more protein, to produce more crops, is obviously going to be very key in all of this. And the last thing I would say is the whole issue of conservation of natural resources. And we've done a great job on this. But how do we reduce nitrogen uh, into, uh, let's say, the water supply, or carbon dioxide into the air? Or how do we better provide forestry, uh, which sucks up a lot of carbon, which will help us in terms of the long term? This, these are all great research issues that are going to have to be dealt with by major universities like the University of Nebraska and uh, also by young people all over this country. So what to do? Well, we need a grand strategy. And I mentioned uh, when I started my remarks that the United States must provide, be the leader. We are uniquely positioned to lead a global call for action in the world. But we've got to put our money where our mouth is. And that means is that we can't not let a continued decline in resource availability in both the public and the private sector be too much the routine in the future. We also need to develop champions. If you were to ask me who are the real champions, worldwide champions of agriculture research in over the last 50 years, I'd give you two names. One is Norman Borlaug, the author of The Green Revolution the only agriculturalist who ever won the Nobel Peace Prize, who probably saved tens of millions of people from dying around the world because of his intensive work on increasing yields in wheat and in rice and preventing disease in those crops. And the other is not involved in agriculture at all. His name is Dr. Francis Collins, and he's the head of the National Institutes of Health. And he's out there pounding the payment, pavement every day about the need to increase the quality and longevity of human life by having adequate research. And I was thinking about these two fellows, and in clo my closing remarks, I would just say, uh, human life is so, and, and, and is so much involved and connected with agriculture. It always has been. And so what we need to do is to recognize that not only are we positioned to lead a global call for action, but we need to act at all levels, from the President to the Congress to the Department of Agriculture to states, to universities, to private sector, to companies all over this world. We need to make this the priority that it needs to be. And in doing so, I think that grand, stra grand strategy will make the world a lot better place to live over the next century. Thank you all very much. So what we want to do now is to have some time for the panel to dialogue on these issues. And I'll, I'll try to steer our conversation a little bit um, around some of the important parts of the, of the topic. So Kathy did a nice job of laying out for you 
the federal arm of the research enterprise and some of the state inputs that match with the experiment station and extension uh, work through that funding. And then Dan's provided a few of the grander challenges associated with taking that global lead and the importance of it. I guess I'd start the conversation maybe a bit around building on that model that we have had and recognizing the decline that we've had in, in real dollars in investment over the last number of years that you pointed out, Kathy. What are some of the discussions that are occurring? We've kind of it direct, indirectly referred to a Greece discussion, the Chicago Council's discussion. There's a, another report uh, from the President's mm -hmm. Council on Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAS as it's known, uh, that came out about a year ago, talking about some of the changes that we might need to make mm -hmm. to meet this challenge and to increase our investment. So let's start there, if we would. So maybe we, should, we could talk a little bit about the PCAS report, what that is, what it said in relation to what we're doing, agree, some of the conversation that mm -hmm. agrees had. Uh, PCAS, what, did, what, what was that all about? Okay, I, I can try to answer that. Um, PCAS is the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So this is a group of eminent scientists. Uh, many of them come from academia, and the remainder come from the private sector. And they are advisors directly to President Obama. Uh, and for the first time in the history of this Council of Advisors, um, that goes back many years, presidents have had these councils for, for many, many years. Uh, but for the first time, they addressed the question of, are we ready to face the challenges that are confronting agriculture. And they came up with a report just a year ago uh, saying, no, they don't think our current research enterprise is up to the challenge. Um, we are underinvesting, and uh, they made uh, the recommendation that we have a new, what they're calling innovation ecosystem for agricultural research, that we shift to a more competitive stance um, that the Congress appropriate more funds for competitive funding of agricultural science. And they also recommended that we create what they call six innovation institutes that would be public-private partnerships and would be focusing research efforts on some of these, these challenges. So this morning we had a listening session in Omaha um, with a, about 50 people showing up uh, to get some advice on you know, past experience in working with this kind of innovation institute. So that's what PCAST is. But to Dan's challenge about US leadership in, in agricultural science, there is another new uh, innovation, and that is for the G20 countries. Um, they have agreed to form uh, a, a meeting of agricultural chief scientists uh, that would be providing advice directly to the presidents of the G20 countries about agricultural research, setting our priorities, recognizing that uh, in most countries there are limited resources that are going into agricultural science and that we could get a whole lot more out of that investment if we work together as opposed to each setting our own research agendas. So those meetings are, uh, are continuing. This year, Australia has the presidency of the G20, and we're looking to work with them in convening this, this meeting. So that's one way that we're also stepping up to that leadership role, Dan, that, that, that you mentioned. What about the AGREE report in Chicago Council? Well. Um, you know, one thing I would say, it's not necessarily bad that other countries are spending money on agriculture research right. because, you know, I mean, uh, the New University of Nebraska, I presume, has scientists in other countries. You're training students that come here and go back to other right. countries. And these countries want to be secure, food secure, as, be, as much as they can. So it's, uh, this is not an arms race. What it is is that we have the most talented infrastructure, our land-grant colleges, our research institutions, 
We're the reason why Brazil is now a, an agriculture right. powerhouse. We trained virtually, well, not virtually all of them, but many of their scientists, and they, they adopted what we're doing. And so I, I think it's important to say that, that we don't have to be doing all the work, but we have to be a leader in this work in order to get it done. Now, I, I'm involved in the two. Chicago Council has been working on global food security, how we can build up the developing world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, so they can become self, as, as self-sufficient as they can. And Phil's been working with both the Chicago Council and AGREE in providing advice on how to help the developing world. Um, we used to do a lot more in that area than we've done in recent years. And an AGREE is, is this multi-foundation effort. It's got an interesting name, AG, capital AG, AG, RE, Research Education <laughs> Extension, AGREE. <laughs> And its goal, uh, it's, the website is called foodandagpolicy.org, if anybody wants to go link to it. But it's got major foundations, many of whom have never even had an iota of interest in food and agriculture before in their lives. And they've become interested in it, and they've decided this is a big issue, food safety, food security, um, it, rural development, a whole bunch of issues to put some resources into to elevate the level of the debate. Phil? Yeah, I guess, comments? Uh, I guess a comment I'd like to make is uh, that it, 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 there's, there's moments in history when things shift, and th this is a moment in history, I think, with respect to US policy and, and leadership uh, on public ag R&D. Um, and as Dan said, I, I sit as someone who spent a career worrying and, and researching on these issues, a little forlorn that in the current farm policy debate, there is so little, if any, attention being played to, to sort of how the landscape has shifted and what the US role was, is now and, and could be going forward. And I, I, I think part of it reflects the fact that there are very long lags in these processes that play out. So the, the sort of position that the US is in now has been evolving over the last 20 or 30 years. It wasn't made in the last three or four years. And so we, I, I have put some numbers together myself that have gone back even further than the ERS numbers. And, and uh, 50 years ago, China, the Chinese system in real terms was about uh, a quarter the size of the US system. And as Kathy said, it is now larger than the US system in, in terms of total funding. Uh, and if you look even more broadly than that and look at the middle income countries are now collectively spending more than the rich countries on public sector food and ag R&D. And that just didn't happen over a, period, a, a year or two. I, I did personally a lot of work out in China 20 years ago and I interacted a lot with senior policymakers then and they made a very conscious decision then that they were going to both invest in food and agriculture R&D and sustain the course. Uh, and it's the, persist the persistence pays, really pays off in the end. And I think uh, the, the sorts of lags that are involved, I think, are, are not particularly well known even to people within agriculture. I mean, if you look at key technologies like hybrid corn, uh, that was 50, 60 years in the making from when the very early science was done back in the 1870s and 1880s through to the 1930s when that technology came on stream. BT corn was nearly 100 years in the making, the early science, and that was done in Germany and Japan back in 1901, 1902. So I think those of us in the game in R&D know these long lags, but I think it, uh, people who are making policy uh, are looking for sort of uh, an election cycle with a three or five or six year lag, right. uh, whereas it's decadal in terms of the impacts that we have. So I think we, if you get this moment in time, as Dan and Kathy said, there is a, a renewed focus on food and agriculture R&D. I think it, the trick is to put substantive institutional change in place that will outlive perhaps the, the spotlight that's on food and ag at the moment so that those sustained investments will carry forward over the decades ahead. So I think it really is a very pivotal time right now. So Kathy, I think you mentioned in your comments about the current budget that we've been waiting on for some time and the news out of Washington being somewhat positive about 2014 appropriations and the final touches being put on that, we think that, yeah, I think it's fair to paraphrase, would put us back to a little higher than we were in 2012, which was, you remember the word sequester? Mm -hmm. We sequestered funds in, in ag research and extension this past year, about an 8% level um, that all organizations uh, assume. So we're, we'd be back to the positive, a bit positive in growth with the numbers that are, that are in the appropriations now. But you also mentioned, Dan, you mentioned, I think, this issue of policy in the farm bill. And even though we have this pivotal point in time uh, 
as we've described and the need for this lead and all the reasons out to the next half century that we need to be doing those things, the ability to move that policy in the Farm Bill to increase the research and ed investment has been very challenging, to say the least. What, why? Why do, why do you think that is? And I'll, I'll phrase it this way. So you mentioned Francis Collins, the, the human genome leader, the head of NIH now, who, who is, has had a huge impact on fundamental science and in, in genetics and beyond. And he leads a very large research enterprise that's very well funded and has grown in its capacity over time in the biomed and human health arena in the National Institutes of Health. Now, I might be a little bit bold in saying this, but some might argue that the, one of the heaviest subsidies of an industry, if you want to use the word subsidy, would be in pharma and in biomed. I've come from that world. I lived in pharma a while myself because of the huge investment of the federal government in the research capacity for human health and for NIH. Why have we not been able to do that in the farm sector or in the ag sector? Back to this issue in the farm bill, why can't we get that traction? Comments there? Well, I, I, I think there's two different um, categories of reasons why. Uh, one category of reasons is that for the broader U.S. population, food supply is great. You know, less than 10 percent of my income over this last many decades has been going to, right. to food. Um, haven't had any shortages. Velveeta right now is saying <laughs> they've got a shortage, That's but, a you know, as far as major food problems, there hasn't been shortages really since, since the, the 1930s. So, you know, you've got multiple generations now that have grown up with this abundant food supply and far away from the farm and the farm economy. So uh, that's one category of reasons. Um, I think that's reflected by an experience that happened during the Clinton administration when the administration did this big analysis of our critical infrastructure. It came out with a big report about all of these very critical aspects of, of, of infrastructure, cyber, water, you know, all of these things, banking, and food wasn't on the list. Nobody thought of that as being critical to our infrastructure. So that's, you know, in that basket. The other reason is that our agricultural problems are so diverse. We have, you know, a half dozen major food animal species. We have literally hundreds of crops. Each animal, each crop has got its own set of diseases and pests. So when our organizations go in to lobby on behalf of the ag appropriations, they've got their narrow interests. And with the contrast with NIH, there's been a concerted effort over the years to speak with uh, a united message that NIH funding is important. And yes, within that, there are lots of others, but you know, the big message is NIH funding for research very important, unified message. I, you know, I, I don't mean to get too down on the Congress because I, they are at 9% approval rating. I wonder who the 9% is. <laughs> I, I, was, I was one for 18 right. years, and I'm proud of it. So it, it. Even with all the incivility, it's still a great institution, great country we have. But you'll probably never get great leadership out of the Congress on the issue of agriculture research. You may get some congressmen that are more interested in it than others, and that's why you, the great leadership has come from great leaders in the private sector and the, in the, in the university world and, and those other kinds of things. It is so disappointing, however, that almost all of the debate and the discussion on this farm bill has been on, on none of the issues that we're talking about today, really, and, and that, is, that is disappointing, and I'm not necessarily sure whose fault it is. And, 
And I don't just uh, uh, want to blame only the Congress on this, because sometimes I think the President could be talking more about these issues. You don't have to comment on that, and I'm free to say whatever I want on those things. <laughs> you know? But, but uh, the, you know, I mean, the executive branch has their priorities, and I sometimes think this needs to be a, a, a little bit higher priority. But just the one thing on the medical thing, you know, somebody, it's a tragic when you, somebody in your family gets a serious disease, but everybody's mortal. <laughs> and we're all affected by diseases which limit, from, limit immortality. And that makes every one of us interested in what's the, what the National Institutes of Health are doing and the pharma's doing, to, whether, they're, whether it's all very effective or not, I can't answer that question. But we all seem to have a personal stake of that. And what we have to do is to try to find a way to build more of a personal stake on the food and agriculture uh, side of the picture. Right. Uh, Phil and I had the opportunity to be on this panel that's been reviewing the competitive grants program of USDA, USDA's request uh, for the past year. And I, I'd kind of like to segue a little bit into discussion about the current system that we have and some of these calls that are out there being thought about, is the current system optimized? Uh, do we have the structure right, the land grant model that we've had successfully for 150 now plus years? Is that system optimal for the next half century? Um, competitive versus capacity funding, like Hatch and mm -hmm. Smith Lever funds for extension and experiment station. Um, and the, the idea of funding being all within USDA. One of the things PCAST reported out in that report was increasing funding in the National Science Foundation for fundamental agricultural research and having some different kind of models thrown out around in this discussion. Any, any discussion on that, Phil? You might um, have a comment, Kathy? Um, maybe a couple of things on, uh, we were focusing on the politics of Washington and I think you need to look at the politics of the state too. I mean, one of the distinguishing attributes of agriculture is that uh, a lot of uh, the technology is very local in terms of its effectiveness and so forth, just because of the, the difference in agroecological agri sorts of circumstances and so forth. And so, you know, state and local support is just as important as federal support. And if you actually look at the facts, uh, notwithstanding this um, uh, slowdown in, in federal funding, and in fact a, a retreat, a, a disinvestment in real terms in public at the public level for food and ag r and at the federal level, the same thing's been happening at the state level as well. So I went and looked at the numbers on the way out here, um, and it looks like Nebraska's the outlier. We were talking earlier about sort of a, a revival and a, and a strengthening of support from the state level to, to this great university. Um, but if you look at the numbers overall, uh, barely uh, a state dollar goes in to match every of these declining uh, federal dollars today. Uh, back in the 50s, it was four state dollars, more than four state dollars for every federal dollar going into the land grant universities. So uh, we might look to DC for a lot of the blame, right. but it, but but there's a there's a sort of pervasive retreat from investment in the public sector. And I think that when I look globally, which I do at sort of the experimentation in terms of ways of financing of, of R and D, the distinguishing attribute in the US is that there's been a, a failure of a public dialogue, as I'd see it in thinking of alternative ways to re-engage state governments with respect to, to research uh, and to, to engage uh, commodity groups and farm sectors and to engage agribusiness in creative institutional arrangements to perhaps co-finance publicly performed research. And I think you have to be very clear about distinguishing who pays for the research and who does it. They're related but very different ideas. And so in other countries around the world, you know, speaking parochially, this is not a modulated Minnesota accent you hear, it's a, it's a down under Aussie accent. Um, and they instituted some reforms back in the 80s where 60% uh, of the publicly performed research in Australia now is co-financed by industry and government. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just a matter of how much money went in, it was a lot of subtle institutional reform that got put in place about who has a stake in how those funds are spent and to, to sort of engage or re-engage the farming community in the deployment of those dollars so that it wasn't left at the discretion of politicians or scientists who are active rent seekers for their own scientific efforts and so forth. There was a, a balancing of, of who helps allocate and decide on those allocations. And I mm -hmm. think thinking very carefully about the sort of incentive structures and institutions that, that sort of that disperse the funds but also raise the funds 
is a lot more complicated, but it's where I think you can get a re-engagement. And I guess I'm encouraged the work Dan's doing with AGREE and, and CSIS and um, Chicago Council and so forth, it is pulling in a new set of players. I think the trick is, to, 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 as I said earlier, to sort of mobilise that action and think about sort of beyond just more bucks out of state legislatures and federal legislatures to think about the institutional architecture of, of funding the research and deploying the dollars. Yeah. Well, you, you referenced the CRCs, the Cooperative Research Centres, and the approach in Australia that they've taken to public-private partnership in large-scale problem-focused research projects there now for a couple of decades plus. Mm -hmm. Um, the Innovation Institute's idea, Kathy, that you mentioned that you had a listening session on this morning in Omaha, um, is a proposal of not exactly like CRC, but a public-private partnership where public support, private support would undergird the idea of these new Innovation Institutes. Do you want to comment on on the interpretation of that at this point, where, where you're headed in thinking about that? Well, uh, we're currently really early in our thinking. Uh, um, we've been conducting a series of, of listening sessions, but um, Ronnie, you're right that, you know, as far as the broad outlines are, that these would be uh, public uh, investments that would have a, a match from private sector partners. Um, there certainly have to be a dialogue, to, to Phil's point, about what are the topics or the themes that the private sector really wants to engage around in, in, a, in a research partnership. Um, they would have to have um, a, a governance structure that would allow the voices of the, the, the private sector members as well as the, the scientific community in, in establishing what those research projects would be that would be pursued. Um, certainly agreement up front about intellectual property. Whenever you enter into a research in, in engagement like this where there are public and private funding, that's, that's a very important uh, set of, 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 of decisions to be made up front. Um, and, and I think also that these, these institutes would um, have to, they, we, we would be focused on, on the research and not on buildings, not, not on bricks and mortar. So, right. you know, they'd be, you know, kind of uh, uh, decentralized because there'd be multiple partners in, in multiple institutions but we wouldn't be looking to, to build buildings with them. We'd really be looking to see what the agreed on research would be and what would be coming out of that of benefit, mutual benefit to those who are investing. You know, I just may add, one area this is happening much more than even in the United States is in the developing world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. I met yesterday with the administrator of USAID they, by the way, have a great interest in the water work that you're doing right. here at the University right. of Nebraska. But they're working in partnerships with some of the big seed companies like DuPont and Monsanto, as well as some of the uh, food companies on a whole bunch of, of, of intensification of, of smallholder farmers being able to increase their yields and techniques to provide uh, new fertilizer technologies into Malawi and Zambia and Tanzania and some of these other places. And, working with the World Food Program where I'm beginning to actually see collaboration taking place where we're not afraid of the private sector. I think there's been some fear, for, and some of them may be legitimate reasons mm -hmm. because of, you know, I mean, a few of the seed companies have engendered some ill will, uh, but at the same time they're doing powerfully important research and we shouldn't be afraid of engaging with the private sector, ob obviously taking into account the issues that Kathy just raised on intellectual property ownership issues and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to raise one more topic for us before we kind of open the floor up. So if you've got a burning question, begin in your head. Um, there will be mics on the end, gain the attention of the, the ladies on the ends of the, the aisles that will have those mics, and they'll, you'll need to go to the mic to um, ask your question. But before we do that, let's go back to the Brazil-China discussion a bit. And, and I, I agree with you, uh, Dan, that 
that it's a good thing when other countries are upping their investment because the need is great and we need to have yeah. everything we can thrown at innovation to meet the challenges ahead globally. But I'll, I'll take a little, just throw out a little different scenario for you from someone that sits in a role like mine. So if you're administering an enterprise that's focused on these issues locally and beyond local, and you see the resources that China is investing, or you see the resources that Brazil is investing, or India was mentioned in your slides, Kathy, and some others around the world that are investing very heavily in this space. It's also somewhat natural to assume that people like me are going to be off looking for partnerships with those places that are making those big investments, both on education and research, right? China is the obvious big, big uh, uh, monkey, big, you know, big elephant in the room, so to speak. And I bump into my colleagues on a regular basis in China uh, from land-grant universities all over the country who are doing that. Is, is that, I don't, I shouldn't use the word good, bad, or indifferent, but how to, is, how, where's that fall? Is that a good thing? Is that a, what, any comments you might provide on that? Well, you know, it was Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, who was asked, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, if these, if these countries are going to spend that, those kind of resources, although they're not a limitless right. uh, pot either of dollars, and, and they're slowing down a bit, their rate of growth is slowing down, but they're still, they, they, this is a priority to them. They've made this important. Food security. They don't want to have to rely on the rest of the world. They worry about droughts and about pests and about, and they worry about another revolution. If the peasants can't get enough to eat, you know, we, we might see the whole thing start over there again. So they've made it a priority. And I, we're not going to stop them from mm -hmm. doing it. What we have to do is make it a priority here. And the, the first place you do that, frankly, is in the educational system where you train young people who are smart, who know these subjects, and are willing to go out and try to change the world. Yep. That's, I think that's the heart of where we're still ahead of the rest of the world. Yep. And, and I would say yeah, that, that for the time being, um, the U.S. is still the intellectual leader in the agricultural sciences. Um, if you, you, know, you look across our universities, um, they're usually, and, and I would include ARS in this as right. well. Um, right. You know, if you use the criteria that we in the academic community use to evaluate our standing, um, across the agricultural disciplines, um, the U.S. comes out number one, maybe number two in a few cases, you know, pretty much across the board in the, in the agricultural discipline. So, so we're still the intellectual lead. Um, I think with respect to our competitors, uh, it's, it, it really is important now to be strategic in who we engage with and what we do. Mm -hmm. And to choose those partners very carefully uh, and to enter into these agreements for research in, in education in ways that there's going to be a mutual benefit. Um, because that way you're going to have a meaningful engagement and you're going to have something that's going to endure over time. But that, that combination of you know, looking for people you can partner with and then figuring out what are the areas where there's going to be a mutual benefit right. is going to pay off over the, the long term. Anything add, Phil? Yeah, you know, the, the essence of uh, agriculture is in the jargon of economists is spillovers, that uh, just because we do the science here doesn't mean we, we capture all the benefits, and likewise, just because yeah. science right. takes place in the rest of the world doesn't mean they capture all the benefits. Uh, much to the chagrin of my father-in-law, who's a big corn bean grower in southern Minnesota, he bemoans the fact that some great USDA technology in soybean genetics went down to Brazil, and now <laughs> they're his principal competitors. And then I reminded him where in the world did soybeans come from, and it's from yeah. China. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that, that's the essence of the nature of these spillovers, that they go in both directions. But I totally agree with Kathy. I mean, being strategic 
uh, not just on how you do your science within your own borders, but how you partner and how you shape the nature of those spillovers. I think going forward, that's going to be very different in the 21st century than it was in the 20th century. And, and some agencies get it. So just going back to Embrapa, which is the USDA yeah. of Brazil, Brazil. Good example. Uh, they have a system of, of deliberate <laughs> spillovers called X-Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one was they set up a joint venture arrangement with USDA at mm -hmm. Beltsville. Uh, where they had improper funded research going on in partnership with the USDA right. in Beltsville, but they didn't stop there. They went and set one up uh, uh, in um, Montpellier. Uh, they set another one up in Seoul, Korea. Uh, they've set another one up in Beijing. Uh, and so they're looking very deliberately about who they're going to partner with on what areas of science. And the private sector are doing that. I mean, the, the private sector think internationally, even US companies are also Hormel, latest two labs, one's in uh, uh, Seoul, Korea, uh, a meat research lab, and the other one they set up in Shanghai. Uh, they're looking at where their markets are going to develop. So I think that the agribusiness community is not always necessarily on the same page because the, the post-farm interests are not necessarily always aligned with the US on-farm interests. Uh, they do in some cases, but not in all. And so it's, it's a very complex, you know, I think sure. they pointed to 90 cents in every dollar of the food dollar is post-farm, and so there's going to be lots of pressure to, to sort of shape the innovation processes at, at that end of the, the value chain, but we need to tend the turf on the home end as well, and, and that, that's part of my worry, that there's a, uh, been a, a significant nibbling away of farm productivity-oriented research within the US system right. to address a lot of the problems Dan mentioned, which are legitimate problems in terms of the uh, obesity and health consequences of, of nutrition, um, the environmental consequences of agriculture and vice versa. And it's not to deny that they need uh, and, and, and are worthy of social investments, but coming at the expense of, not in addition to sustaining and enhancing farm productivity, I think is why we're in the situation we're in now where we've got this uh, rundown of the spending at the s and the rundown of the productivity trends that right. uh, that uh, Cathy mentioned. I, I, I was shocked, so uh, stem rust, uh, I think, Dan mentioned that. Uh, it's a pretty ancient disease when we invented wheat 10,000 years ago, Mother Nature invented stem rust and, mm -hmm. and other forms of rust, so it's not a new disease. Um, and in uh, 1999, a whole new variant of that disease popped up in Uganda. It's called UG99. It turns out virtually none of the world's bread wheats have any resistance to this uh, variant of stem rust. And the USDA have a really talented set of people in the Serial Disease Lab sitting about 300 metres from where I sit on the St Paul campus. Uh, and they, they're the world's expert in this, er in this disease. And I asked them before the USDA re-engaged in this problem and Gates Foundation and so forth, how many full-time equivalent scientists were on the cutting edge of stem rust globally? And their estimate was five people. We thought we'd been there, done there, and solved that problem. Right. And, and the For a disease that could have wiped out the entire world. Right, so yeah. we're playing we catch up now on that disease. And I see that across the board that, uh, the, that Mother Nature's pretty niggardly and she tries to invent around <laughs> the resistance and so forth. And, on, and whether or not you believe in climate change, that the climate, climate affects agriculture and we get droughting uh, uh, and we get pests and diseases. And, and just the estimates are we spend 40 to 60 cents on every dollar just to maintain our yield levels and our productivity levels, let alone increase them. Right. So if we start running down that spending, we're going to undercut the past productivity gains, not, not sort of underwrite gains in the future. Yeah. So that's okay, we're going to open the floor for questions. And if you'll work your way to the center or the end, the mics will come to you. There's one up here, Judy. And another here, so Judy and Cheryl are on these ends. So if you, Judy, you're going to come to the middle, or they're going to, you're going to go to the, they're going to go to you. Yes. Okay. So you'll need to go to the ends. So if you have a question, migrate that way, Guillermo. Mike. Well, thank you, uh, all of you, for the presentation tonight. It's very enlightening. Um, I guess I, I, I'm looking at a quandary that I'd like for you to maybe give some, shed some light on, has maybe due to with education and public perception. Um, I was at a meeting earlier this spring with a group of agricultural people from across the world, actually, but many throughout the United States uh, uh, when the Berkshire Hathaway uh, meeting was held. And it was interesting, there were 50 people in the room, and the moderator asked the question out of the gate, does anyone in the room believe that agriculture will have any difficulty producing sufficient food 
for the demand in the future. Two of us raised our hand. Two of us. Now, with that said, I look at current events. General Mills comes out a week ago and announces that Cheerios are no longer going to be made with GMO grain. Uh, Tyson Foods have said we're going to eliminate gestation crates. McDonald's Corporation has said gestation crates, if that's not going to be any part of the pork that's coming through our system. So it, it gets back to, Mr. Secretary, maybe some of your comments about the things that sway back and forth in the agricultural communities. Think about the producers that have gestation crates that invested in those and bankers that may have financed those uh, five years ago, and now all of a sudden their technology can no longer be accepted. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is your reaction to, I'm giving you two different perspectives. One that says, if you don't go down the GMO road and you really start contracting how we raise livestock, how are we going to deliver the food that a big group of people that I think are pretty intelligent groups say, not, that's a slam dunk, it's a layup, no problem. How do you reconcile that and how do we, how do we get that perception a little more clear? And Kathy probably. Well, I, I <laughs> that was I, a great deflection. Right, right, right. yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I think from from a research perspective, one of the ways that we're dealing with these public values issues about what do we want our food supply to to be composed of uh, is by supporting you know the whole spectrum of of, of breeding approaches. Um, but also with a big emphasis on the understanding of the genetics, um, the, the making public the information that comes from our research that identifies the, the, the traits that are present within the germplasm, for example, that's within our own collections. Uh, and providing those to breeders um, is, you know, in, inherent in, in this approach. So we're supporting organic research, we're supporting classical breeding, and we're supporting all of the new technologies um, that uh, are uh, being applied in crops and in, and in livestock. I just so I, I, and I believe that we're not going to face that challenge of, of food and fiber and everything else that's being asked of, of agriculture unless we use all of those tools in, in the toolbox. I, I, two things. That, one, I do have this great worry about uh, the diminution of science. Of, of, you know, there are some basic truths in life, like up is up and down is down, and you know, those things are just happen. And, mm -hmm. and I worry about people who manipulate science on all sides for their own ideological perspective. It happens, and it's troubling, and it has, that's not just a food issue, that's an uh, issue across the, board, uh, across the board that we've got. And that's accentuated by the nature of our media today, because social media has changed the world. It empowers individuals to create ideas and send them out without a lot of vetting. And you may not like the, the network folks up there talking to you on the 6.30 or 7 o'clock news, but for the most part, what they say is not absolute false. And for the most part, it's true, and it's been vetted. And so the way of our communication techniques today, using our smartphones and everything else, allows a lot of ideas to percolate that aren't necessarily valid. That's, I'm not sure what we can do about that except do our best to expose the truth where it comes out and have people engage the debate because the positive side of this is you've democratized the world a lot. You don't have to be Warren Buffett to get your ideas out anymore. Even though he's a great man, he doesn't live very far from here. But you can get your ideas out through these new devices. And so we've got to help people and train people to understand that, that they have, there's, a, there's a societal cost from spilling out false and inaccurate information. And it's, a, it's troubling. I don't have a magic answer to it. However. LaVon? Uh, I'd like to pose a, a, a scenario for you, something uh, that we did a number of years ago when uh, n a number of us working for uh, uh, various organizations in Montana, uh, we found ourselves, as, as was mentioned here, on, on differing views among the organizations that permitted uh, legislators to say, well, once you folks can agree on something, then we'll take some action, but we can't now since you're so divided. So we started a, a forum 
And uh, I wonder about the feasibility of this both at the state and federal level now. And that is, uh, we would meet on a, on a Friday or, or Saturday uh, over dinner and a glass of lemonade and discuss our position on the uh, various measures that were coming before hearing the next week. And if we could all agree on one position for everybody, then well and good. And we'd choose one sp spokesperson to represent that. In other cases, if we were divided, then we'd say, we represent so many organizations, and you'll hear a view from another uh, spokesman for the, a different view, but we're as close together as we could find a way. Is, is that feasible in today's market, both in, in Nebraska and, and uh, nationally? I, I, first off, if you had a glass of wine rather than lemonade, I might come to one of those functions. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's more feasible the more local you get. I mean, when you're in, when you're in a small community or when you're in a, a group of like-minded people, I think it's more feasible. But as you can see, see it's, it's very hard when you're in the United States Congress to do that kind of thing. I'm going to move us pretty fast because there are a number of people standing, and I know I've got to get this gentleman on a plane before too long. So, yeah, uh, Senator. My uh, primary question will go to Dr. Watecki, but I would like to just make a brief comment on trusting the local news. Most of us in Nebraska still remember finally ground lean beef that the uh, national media put out as a bad thing. But that, that's just a comment. My question is, you gave us numbers that are a little discouraging on governmental financing. Do we have any numbers on what the private sector is doing and That's a good question. how we compare on that? And thank you. Yeah, well, um, the, the, the private sector ha is now um, supporting far more in dollars research than, than the combined public state and federal funding going, going to the food and agricultural science. Um, the issue, though, is that um, both in the funding that's going into, that's being spent by the ag industries, you know, the chemical companies, the seed companies, the equipment manufacturing companies, uh, as well as in the food processing sector, uh, there's not much of that that's actually addressing the fundamental science, you know, the, the basic understanding of biological processes that, that's going to lead to the new technologies and the new solutions to um, new diseases that, that, that may be emerging. So, so there is um, a, a, a lot of the concern that's being expressed about this decline in the public investment is that that research that's that's the economists call for public good um, is is not growing, uh, and m much of what the private sector is investing in is to, you know to develop a specific product, um, which is good. That's that's what that should be about. But we're not investing in that long-term research that's the seed corn that people talk about for the future in, in the science. Dean Hills. Thank you for an intellectually stimulating discussion. We talked about R&D spending, we talked about productivity and institutions. So my question is, what kind of institutional changes are needed to increase the productivity of R&D spending, the effectiveness of it? Well, I, I, Phil made some allusions to this in the comments that you were making about it being the time for making some changes um, in, the, in the structure. Yeah, I, uh, Christian Dinos, uh, I, I, it's a complicated one, and I think it's, um, uh, it is, I think, making an explicit uh, uh, recognition that, that aligning the interest groups that fund the research to the types of research that are being funded, I think, is, a, is a, you know, matching the costs and the benefits up uh, is an important uh, piece of the puzzle. I, I remember um, I do a lot of work with a colleague out at UC Davis, and he looked at uh, um, industry financing of uh, wine and grape research in California. Uh, and there was an initial surge of interest and a lot of investment in that area. Uh, and it fell apart because the, the industry structure was such that 
that those R&D dollars got dominated by one subsector of the industry and the other subsector felt that they were putting money into something they didn't get their fair share of the benefits from. And that's a, a, a sort of an ongoing uh, political economy argument and the notion of economists is to try and think about how do you align those interests up. So I think uh, Cathy pointed to, to sort of uh, thinking about uh, putting more information into that decision making process which uh, I'm a strong proponent of. So it's not just informing people about science, it's informing people about the trade-offs involved in deciding you know, what are the likely productivity consequences of putting your money and your R&D bets down on one area of science versus another area of science. And I'm personally doing a lot of work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They're trying to be an evidence-based entity. Uh, they're putting a lot of money into food and ag R&D in sub-Saharan mm. Africa. Uh, but they're trying to, to, to harness the best information they can get, economic, scientific and so forth, to do that. So I think it's a, uh, building those into the allocation systems and, and keeping them fleet of foot uh, so that you don't lock in an, an entity that looks right for this year that in 30 years' time is going to look really archaic, is building in the flexibility to get the, the incentive structures feeding into those allocation decisions. I think it's really, really key. We're going, to do the, we're going to do this, folks that are standing, and then we're going to call it uh, quits. So here's another question to my brother. Dr. Wuteki, uh, I spent the last 25 years of my productive uh, career as a risk manager of commodities with two of the largest three processing, grain processing company in the country. My question is that up until 2002, uh, we focused on profitability of our customers in the United States and profitability of our corporation in the United States. I noticed in your chart that the growth started in Brazil and China around 2002 in that 1980 chart. Since at 2002, we started focusing all of our, not all, a high percentage of our growth in China, Mexico, and Brazil. Uh, and that is continuing today. How do we as a country and a USDA influence a corporation like I work for to get that back here? Or is that possible? Or do we need to? To get it back here? Um. Actually, that, that's a very interesting question. You know, if you look across segments of the economy, whether it's in computers or whether it's in pharmacy, major U.S. corporations are making big investments overseas. So, you know, the, the agricultural sector is, is, I think, doing some of, some of that also, as, as, as you're pointing out. Um, I, I think that's a, a dialogue that uh, somebody like a Secretary of Agriculture actually could convene to have with major corporations in this sector about um, investment in the U.S. Uh, and how important that is for our future. And it's the kind of thing that the organizations right. that, that uh, Secretary Glickman has been working with recently are, are also trying to do in convening people. Judy, another question on your side. Uh, good evening. Uh, my, my question is about sustainability. 1987, the Brandon Commission launched the concept of, of sustainability. 25 years after, we are still grappling with uh, trying to understand it and how we implement it. My question is uh, how we envision sustainability in the concepts you share today from economical perspective alleviating poverty from the government perspective uh, or decision uh, policy makers responding how they improve the responding to the public and from the research how we allocate these resources in order to understand sustainability not just locally but also globally who wants to take that one <laughs> Well, I, I, I could say that I think there has been a major change in thinking, uh, certainly within our research programs, about this question of sustainability and of, of agricultural systems. And that, that it, it, this, the, 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 the big challenge that we're really focusing on is sustainable intensification of agricultural systems in the U.S. And, and globally. 
And I, I see that really pervading our thinking on the research side. So I think there's been a major step forward. And what's happening overseas is big American companies like Mars, Nestle, which is a Swiss company, um, big American food companies, now when they go out and source their product, they have standards that they meet and they are all kind of in this area of sustainable intensification. It, uh, you know, doing as little damage to the environment as you can do and still get the most out of what you're producing. And then they, they, they have rankings now of these companies uh, around the world and, and you're, you're, you're seeing new factors enter this play. This used to be almost all traditional production agriculture, but now you had the food companies and others who are in this as well as foundations like the Gates Foundation. One more question from Helen here, and then we are going to need to cut off because we've got a hard plane Sci to catch. Science Magazine uh, reported in the last couple of weeks that egg cigars were surpassed $3 billion in their funding base. And I just wondered if you would comment on the role of the cigars, in, uh, cigars. particularly for basic research in world um, egg research today. Well, we, we really look to the, the, the international research centers, the CGIAR system, as, as being partners. I was thrilled to see in Science the recent article saying, you know, they've reached this billion dollars in, in funding from the governments that are, that are supporting them. Um, so we partner with them on a lot of research um, and really uh, think it's an integral part of this overall global research system. I am going to need to cut us off because Dr. Glickman, Hidan still has a plane to catch, believe it or not, yet tonight. So we need to get him to that plane. Before while we conclude tonight, I do want to recognize again our panelists and present them with the Hearman Medal. Uh, you'll see a picture of it there on the slide that uh, will be a remembrance for them of being here at the University of Nebraska tonight and part of this panel conversation. So please join me in thanking Dr. Kathy Rotecki, <laughs> Dr. Dan Glickman, <laughs> Dan Glickman. You can call me hey, I call you doctor. And Phil Party. And I was I was joking earlier because Dan got one of these September a year ago for the lecture. And he did wear a kind of bluish purple colored tie that night. Some of you will remember we were joking about it earlier. And if he hadn't shown up in that nice red tie tonight, I was gonna take mine off and give it to him <laughs> so that he'd have it when he came back. But he, he beat me to the punch. I do want to draw your attention in closing tonight to our next lecture, which will be February the 27th. It'll be at 3.30 in the afternoon, and we're welcoming to our campus Dr. Robert Perlberg, who was a lecturer at APLU uh, that Dr. Wotecki sponsored earlier this past fall. Um, Bob's lecture will be entitled Food Politics, What Everyone Needs to Know. Dr. Perlberg is an adjunct professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and, an, and a, a faculty member at Wellesley College. So welcome you to that lecture, February 27th, 3.30 p.m. in Hardin Hall. Thank you for being here tonight. We'll look forward to the next lecture. Thank our panelists. <laughs>